Joining me, as you have said, is Dr. Abed Bwanika. He's the president of the People's Development Party. And uh, he's here basically to elucidate on his agenda for Uganda when he becomes president. Dr. Bwanika, good evening and thanks for talking to us tonight. Thank you and good evening, viewers. How is the campaign going for you so far? The campaign is progressing well. Mm. It is tough, but uh, we are getting going. We are getting going. All right, before we get into the nitty-gritty, let's just take a quick look at this. We believe it is the best manifesto ever. We have proposed to reduce the cabinet from 70 members of cabinet to 30, including the state ministers. For a child between 5 years and 18 to be at school, compulsory, that means they are going to be a law. We don't want to see uneducated next generation. We want to give each family two plowing animals so that you can be able to do proper farming with these plowing animals. Our children reach university when they are very tired. They cannot innovate. They wake up at five, they come back at nine in the night with a lot of homework. I will abolish that. A child from kindergarten to primary three, you go to school up to one and go back home and rest. No homework, no those studying baruke things. A child from P4 to primary five, you come back home by two. A child from P6 to primary seven, by three you are back home. You uh, are. Dr. Buanika, just as we get started, some very quick statistics here. You stood in 2006, uh, that was your first time, and uh, you got 0.95% of the vote, totaling to 65,874 votes. In 2011, you stood again, and uh, you got uh, a much more dismal performance, 0.65%, garnering 51,708 votes, performing poorly a lot uh, was the new candidates, first time as Mao, Nobat Mao at 1.86% and Aulara Utunu at 1.58%. You're doing this for the third time and um, clearly you have been plunging at least from the first time to the second. And uh, the question that keeps lingering in the mind of some people out there is, why are you doing this again? First of all, from a statistical point of view, there is no significant difference between my performance in 20. Uh, 2006 and 2011. What's clear is that you went down? It doesn't matter. I'm a statist I've, I've done statistics. I know when I say there's no significant difference, uh, you mean the, the difference between 2006 and 2011, it is negligible. Uh, what has happened in 2016, uh, these elections, I've tried to rearrange myself in terms of a team in 2006 2011 i had the best manifesto that is not contested in this country that's according to who no every, everyone knows that dr bedberg including yourself <laughs> you know that i have the best manifesto including those who are in power anyway i have i'm a presidential material that one is not doubted but the two cannot make you win an election what I didn't have in 2011, 2006, was a good team. This time, I put up a very good team. We are in the countryside, and we are doing a good job. Let's try and break down what is in your manifesto, which you say is the best manifesto. I've heard that talk quite a bit out there. Yeah. But uh, a couple of things. Uh, the economy, for example, you say that um, you are in 25 years going to make sure that uh, per capita income in this country gets to 10,000 US dollars. Yeah. How do you hope to do that? Currently, it's, uh, you know what it is currently? I know it. What's the current one? $581. $581. Yeah. Well, the 2015 estimate is 686 US dollars. So, uh, leapfrogging from 686 to 10,000 uh, is no mean feat. How do you hope to do that? Our economy, first of all, is very small. $25 billion. Mm. That is Uganda's economy. You mean the GDP? 
Yes, the GDP is 25 billion dollars. The 2015 estimates, IMF estimates, are actually 27 billion US dollars. No, but you don't need to go to IMF. <coughs> you need to go to your boss. <laughs> you don't go through experts of IMF. We have our U-Boss here. And does it say 25? Yes, they give they give the statistical information. I always wonder why people of Uganda think that their own U-Boss, they disregard their information and they, everyone wants to jump to uh, CIA information that is IMF. It is $25 billion. That's our economy. Uh, the economy, because it is very tiny, you cannot create jobs. You cannot provide incomes for our people. So whoever is going to help this country must be talking about how do you expand the economy. There are about five ways you can improve our economy. The most important one is for you to improve the exports. If you improve the exports, money, capital inflow will come into this country. You're improving money that is coming to this country. Our export is so limited. That's why I'm talking about going to those areas where we have a comparative advantage so that we can build a competitive one. Agriculture is the way to go. We have 40 million acres of land. We have a culture of Ugandans who know how to go farming. The markets for food, they are there everywhere in the whole world. The food prices are going up. What we need to do, we must organize our farmers. We must empower them to use the land. We must empower them to use the water so that we go into these markets. I want to put 15% of the national budget into agriculture. Currently, we are putting in 2.5% of our national budget. So I want to put in 2, 1, uh, 15% so that we can empower the farmer to use the land. Secure tractors, we can no longer use a hoe. You cannot go in the same market with Brazil, with Malaysia. You are using a hoe. I but want you're promising two oxen to every family. That is for the families that cannot use tractors. The people of Teso, people of Lango, people of Acholi subregion, parts of West Nile, they use the, 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 the plowing animals. We want to secure two animals per family so that people can plow the land. When they till the land, they will be able to go to the market with quantities. Then we help them when we put in place factories to do value addition so that we don't sell the raw products from the, from the, from the farms. I can give you an example, a country called Vietnam. We are advantaged in terms of agriculture than Vietnam. They sell every year on the international market fish worth $7 billion. That is the Uganda's entire budget for the whole year. We have the biggest lake on the African continent. We have Lake Edward, we have Lake George, Lake Albert. We are still going to that water to do fishing for a nature from the natural fish. 200 metric tons a year from Lake Victoria. We can double that capacity. If we went in two cages, we can do better. We export coffee worth $400 million. Vietnam exports coffee $202 billion a year. We have the land, 40 million acres of land. Israel is a small, tiny country. They have 5 million acres of land. They do more exports than Uganda. What we need to do is to empower our people. I want to put zero tariff in terms of uh, taxes on all agricultural inputs in this country so that the farmers can be able to access. So generally you see you're going to focus quite a bit on agriculture. Let's move to another sector. We don't have too much time. Yeah. The education sector. Um, a couple of things you want to do there, but those that stick out like a sore thumb, you say that uh, children from P1 to senior 6 will study free of charge. Yes. That is plausible, but uh, you go ahead to say that... Um, They'll get free school uniform, they'll get free lunch, and they'll get shoes. How plausible is that? Are you not letting parents abdicate their role so government gets to do everything for these children, and yet parents, you know, give back to these children well knowing they should be able to take care of them at least to an extent? First of all, we must know that the mandate to educate the children of Uganda is the mandate of government. You should never forget that. Where is the role of the parent in this? The parent will come in at the tertiary level. We want them to prepare. We are going to educate a child because it's within the, the, the mandate of government to educate the children of this country. We want to ensure that the next generation, at least they have reached up to senior six, the parent can take over. It is going to be mandatory, it is going to be compulsory for a child six years to 18 to be at school. Do we not see a boom? Parents giving birth to children, sire as many as you can, up to roll, 
government in this case your government no, will you take know, care of as them. more people get to school the less the birth rate becomes that is a common sense the more people are educated the more people are affluent the more people are going to produce less we are still having our, our birth rate i think it is 3. Point something now it used to be 3.4 i looked at the ubo statistics it has gone down to 3 but it is still high the more we educate our people we don't need to be worried about the population if people have gone to school the parents will take on after senior six whether you want your child to go to the college whether you want your child to go to the university they will take on that but what we want as a nation we want an educated a minimum of senior six buying shoes that's not difficult for government buying a shoe buying a school uniform a shoe alone if you go to a class and one child has got a shoe another child does not have that one around will be a constraint for a child who does not have a shoe to study these are things that we need to create a level ground for our kids in school so that they can study better all right let's talk about governance um you said that you're going to cut down the ministerial positions to 30 now that sounds palatable that sounds like good music to the ears of many a ugandan but uh, something that would be a little bit worrying you said that one of the ministries will be a minister of state for Ugandans in the diaspora. Yeah. Now, we have had people clamoring for an MP, you know, representing the poor, an MP representing the uneducated, an MP representing, you know, those in the diaspora. And we kept thinking, wait a minute, is this too necessary? A ministry for Ugandans in the diaspora, how relevant is that? Oh, I've rearranged um, the, my, my strategy for the Minister of Foreign Affairs, what I'm calling the Minister of uh, Foreign Service. We are going to put emphasis on the Ugandans in the diaspora. We have between 1 million and 2 million Ugandans in the diaspora. They send in this country through remissions of a billion dollars every year. That is a huge capital in terms of developing this country. We want to ensure that uh, we link them and we integrate them into our national development. They will need a ministry. We want to know first of all who are they and where are they and what are their capacities so that the, we can integrate them into our national development very well. It was not only going to be a minister of state in charge of the diaspora, but even at our embassies, we want to put out a cheese, especially in countries where we have many Ugandans, the U.S., the, 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 in, in terms of countries in Europe, uh, so that we integrate them. We, we want in, to integrate them into development, into investment. And uh, I mean, a minister of state is not a big thing. It's not a big thing. Another issue that uh, sticks out as you talk about governance, uh, you say that you're going to create two parliaments, a lower parliament and an upper parliament. Look, many Ugandan will tell you that uh, already we have a Brobdingnesian parliament, a huge parliament, you know, 400 plus at least as of this year's election. You want to create two? Isn't that a lot more than is necessary representation? I want to create an upper parliament, that is my proposal, and a lower parliament. But I also want to propose to the people of Uganda so that we reduce the lower parliament. Currently, I think by the end of these elections, we may be having 435 members of parliament. On average, government pays them 20 million per month, whether the allowances or they are a takeaway. Uh, they give them a new car every five years. They are given uh, medical insurance, uh, 50 million and above. Uh, that's a huge sum of money. When they travel outside, on average, they take a per diem of 2 million shillings. Uh, we want to reduce it. My proposal is to reduce it to 170. Every member of parliament should represent 200,000 Ugandans. We are currently between 35 and 40 million, so we will be roughly having a parliament of 170, 180. Why am I proposing an upper parliament? We need a parliament uh, of fewer people that represent regions. When you look at our independence, Uganda came into being by an amalgamation of uh, 15 regions. They are there at uh, parliament. If you want to know them, you, when you read through parliament, when you enter parliament, you can read those regions. I thought that I'm thinking that uh, if we got two members from each of these regions, it's not the, the Senate, um, uh, uh, the, which is the upper parliament, it's not going to operate by numbers. We should have the people in the upper parliament who are going to bring Uganda together. And the, the, we don't need a huge number, two people per region. Regardless of how big the region is, there should be two people representing a region so that 
when the lower parliament deliberates on issues, then the upper parliament can level those issues and every Ugandan will be involved in whatever we are deliberating. At your various campaigns, uh, you every once in a while talk about the issue of corruption and you say you're going to nip it in the bud. Now, that sounds good, but again, it's nebulous, it's not clear. If we are to get to the specificities, how do you intend to fight corruption? It's one of those challenges that really are eating our dinner, if you like. Yes, um, we have very good laws in this country in regard to corruption. And I don't want to enact new laws. We have very good ones. We have very good bodies uh, that, sub that fight corruption in terms of IGG, DPP, the Anti-Corruption Court. Very many of them. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. What I'm going to do, everyone who has worked for government the last 30 years, I'm going to ask you to give accountability of your worth. So I can steal for 29 years and it's okay, I know. You'll only catch up with me after 30 years. But no, bro, this the time last, I can I've said the last 30 years. Mm. The last 30 years. If you have worked for government the last 30 years, we are going to ask you to give accountability of your worth. Those areas which are not explainable, the things which you cannot explain, which you cannot account for, those ones, they will revert to the people of Uganda. It is as simple as that. We are not going to do laws. We have done enough laws. We now want to act. What has been act, uh, lacking in this nation is the will to fight corruption. Just the will. And we are going to come with that will. If you have a building, you must remember where you got the money. If you cannot clearly explain where did you get that money to put to elect that building, then we must, that building must revert to the people of Uganda. We must be not only seen to act, but we must act this time against corruption. We lose uh, between 500 and 1 billion dollars every year through corruption. 1 billion dollars, that is enough money for 1,000 kilometers of tarmac roads in this country. Let's talk a bit about unemployment. It's one of those issues that have nibbled away at Uganda. Yeah. How do you hope to tackle this challenge? Everyone is talking about job creation. <laughs> but you cannot talk about job creation in a 25 billion dollar economy. We must expand the economy bring in money. When you expand the economy, then you are able to create jobs because the economy will be able to accommodate as many people as possible. We have over 83% of the youth, they don't have formal employment. So my take is first of all to expand Uganda's economy. Number two, we want to skill the youth. We have so many people who, are going, who have gone to universities, so many degrees, so many diplomas, but they are not skilled. We want to ensure that we are going to put in place what we call skills enhancement centers in every district to ensure that the skills, are, the, the students, I mean the youth are skilled so that they are employable. When we do that, then we will have people who, are, who can be employed in school. And secondly, we want to emphasize technical schools. I always tell people, there's no nation anywhere in the whole world which has ever developed because of degrees. Nations but you're promising three degrees per family. Yes. That's one of your promises. Yes, but degrees with skills, not just degrees. These days we have so many good people who go to the university, and the only good thing they have acquired is speaking good English. <laughs> we want to emphasize skills. That's what we want to put technical schools in every district so that people can acquire skills. The emphasis is going to be on skills, not just degrees. Dr. Bonica, one issue that raised quite a bit of dust on your campaign trail was uh, you were in uh, Butambala district and uh, you were quoted as having said that you're going to ban the use of English language in schools and offices. You did come out later to say you were misconstrued, you were taken out of context. Uh, what did you mean? No, in uh, underdeveloped nations like uh, Uganda, that's where we have journalists who sit into their so room what did you say? and they manufacture stories. What I didn't say, I've never said that I will ban English. What I said is, in addition to the English language, we need to promote our indigenous language, teach them in school, and be able to use them where necessary. I don't think that it's necessary for a, a local councillor who has been elected to represent people at uh, LOC3, is in a Germany, uh, where people are muddy people, they speak a language that all of them understand in a council meeting. I don't think it should be a requirement for a councillor to speak English. I think where it is necessary, we should allow our people to use their local languages. And I've been saying, there is no nation anywhere in the whole world which has developed because of speaking English. 
English is a language like any other language. All nations, the first 20 great nations in terms of economy, they speak their own indigenous language. We should be relief from South Africa. They have nationalized more than one language. Actually, they have more than, they have four or more. We should allow, we should not feel inferior because we are speaking our, our own indigenous language. And uh, scientifically, those who have done, uh, uh, that, who are in that field, they know that uh, the language which you hear from day one up to five years is the most important, is the one which will determine w what you are going to be in the future. Here we hear, maybe in, in a Choli language, in rural language, and after that, they want you to innovate in English. So I am emphasizing the usefulness of mm. our local languages. We should right. teach them and we should not be uh, you know, fearful thinking that uh, we have to speak English and that means that we are educated. We need to wrap this up very quickly, but uh, one of those other promises that you have made on your campaign trail is that uh, you're going to have mandatory driving uh, lessons for every Ugandan and uh, that every family should have at least one car. Some people have responded and said that's very simplistic. No, it's not simplistic. It's not actually going to be just mandatory driving. Most people the majority of the people on, on Ugandan roads, they don't know how to drive. They can move a car from one place to another. The reason why we get accidents, the reason why we get lots of traffic jams, not that we have so many cars in this city <laughs> and on the roads. We have fewer cars actually in Uganda, but it's because people don't know how to drive. They have not been taught that they are highway codes. They don't know the, these traffic rules. We want to ensure that everyone gets a refresher course so that we can use these roads properly. That's what I want to do. Uh, on, how, on whether someone is going to get a car, the government is not going to, to buy for a car. But if you are earning $10,000 a year, you should be able to buy yourself a car. A car is not a luxury. A car is a necessity. We will drive towards that, and that one I said, it's my vision in the next 25 years. Every Ugandan should have a car. We should have three degrees in a family. We should have a life expectancy of 75 and years. And hopefully good roads on which yes. to drive these cars. We no need to problem. wrap this up. But finally, how do you expect to perform on February 18th when Ugandans go to the polls? Very well, very good. What percentage will you clinch? Uh, my, I'm working towards becoming the president of Uganda. And uh, what percentage do you think you will get? When I don't care about percentage. Done? I care about becoming the president of Uganda. Whether I become the president of Uganda by 50.1%, that's what I'm working for. My energy is becoming the president of Uganda. And I will become the president of Uganda. All right. I hope yeah. the next time I interview you, I will not be asking you why you failed to make it for the third time, but uh, how you made it as president of Uganda. Yeah, I will become the president of Uganda. Dr. Bedwanika, thanks for talking to us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you.